Hi. Welcome to another episode of I Dig Dead People. In researching a French-Canadian ancestry, I came across a most interesting story. I was researching Marie-Therese Pointvin, who was born the 6th of June, 1715, in Charlesbourg, Quebec, Canada. In her baptismal record from the Drouin collection, I could easily make out her father's name, Jeanne Pointvin but it was very difficult to make out her mother's name. If you've ever looked at records from the French Canadian Drouin collection, you know what I mean. Legibility is not always good with these records, especially the really old ones. And of course, you need to know French. So I then looked for Marie Therese's marriage record and found that in the Drouin collection as well. She married Francois Didier de Grey, the 10th of April, 1736 in Quebec. Her parents are listed as Jeanne Pointven and Francois Rotis. It was impossible to see her mother's given name in her baptismal record, but in the baptismal record the surname was similar to Rotis, just like this marriage record. But it kind of looked more like Rosati, R-O-Z-O-T-T-Y. I then checked the Tanguay collection for Jeanne Pointven. This typewritten record often helps to figure out those illegible documents in the Drouin collection. Sure, sure enough, in the Tanguay collection, it said that Jeanne Pointvin married Francois Rosati the 29th of October, 1696, in Beauport, Quebec. Now, that last name looks more like an Italian name than a French one. I immediately began looking for their marriage record in the Drouin collection because I knew it would list Francois's parents' names, and I could get to the bottom of this strange surname. I easily found uh, the marriage record of Jean Pointvin and Francois Rosati in the Drouin collection, and this record was very legible. Jean and Francois were married the 29th of October, 1696, in Beauport, Quebec. I continued reading through the record to see who the parents were of this couple. Jean's parents were another Jean Pointvin and Magdalene Guillaudeau of Charlesbourg Parish. Francois Rosati's information was a bit more interesting. The document says she was an English girl brought from her native land of Boston by the savages. Basically, Francois was an English girl from Boston captured by Native Americans and brought to Quebec. Well, this was interesting. I had to find out more about Francois and her family. So I then looked up attacks by Native Americans in the mid-1600s near Boston. Our story takes us back to the founding of Dover, New Hampshire in 1623. The settlers of Dover were originally from Massachusetts. They enjoyed a half century of peaceful interaction with the local Native American tribes. However, there was unrest between Native Americans and English settlers in Massachusetts in 1676, and many, many Native Americans escaped to the Dover area to settle with the local tribes there. There were about 41 families in Dover at this time, and their leader was Major Baldurn. Men from Massachusetts pursued the escaping Native Americans to Dover, and with the help of Major Baldurn, they recaptured them, and they took them back to Massachusetts, where they faced death or slavery. Shortly after this, the leader of the local Dover tribes was replaced by a more warlike leader, and I'm sure I'm not gonna get his name right, but it's Ken Kankamagas. Tensions mounted over the next 11 years as the Native Americans' land was encroached upon by more English settlers, and by 1684, the governor in New Hampshire ordered garrisons to be built through public expense in the Dover area. Cocheco was a Dover neighborhood that turned five homes into garrisons where people could flee during a Native American attack. Those homes were owned by Richard Waldern, Richard Otis, Elizabeth Hurd, Peter Coffin, and Tristram Coffin. So a little information on each of these garrisons. They were built with foot-thick logs to keep bullets from piercing. And the second story was built with an overhang all around with an opening in the floor to pour boiling water down on anyone who was trying to fire the house. Around each garrison was a thick eight foot tall wall. And people began sleeping overnight in these garrisons as tensions rose. And some loyal Native Americans warned of an impending attack on Cocheco. A letter arrived from Governor Bradford on June 27, 1689, warning of an attack as well. That same evening, on June 27, 
several Native American women were allowed entrance to the garrisons, and this was apparently pretty typical. Um, the women were shown how to open the doors to the garrison so they could leave in the night or early in the morning. After everyone went to bed that night, these same Native American women opened the doors for hundreds of Penacook Indians who were attacking the garrisons. Uh, Major Waldron's garrison was overrun first, and he was uh, brutally killed, as were many of his family. Those who survived were taken captive and the house was burned. It was a similar scene at Richard Otis's home as well. This is the home we want to take particular notice of. Richard Otis, his son Stephen, and his daughter Hannah were killed. Richard's third wife, Grizel, was taken captive along with their three-month-old daughter, Margaret. Two of Richard Otis's grandchildren were recorded as being taken captive, but records do not name who they were. The other three garrisons were not burned. However, the Coffin family's two garrisons were looted. In all, 23 people were killed and 29 were taken captive. Records indicate that three Otis daughters were rescued in a nearby town. Again, no names are mentioned, but the fact that one record states two grandchildren of Richard Otis were taken, and three Otis daughters were rescued, leads one to believe that there were many Otis family members, family members who still remained captive, including Richard Otis's wife, Brazelle, and their three-month-old daughter, both of whom are found in records in Quebec. The reason Richard Otis's family was of interest to me is because of the name. Francois's last name, Rosodi, is curiously similar to the phonetic French spelling of Otis, O-T-I-S. During my research, I found others who hypothesized that Francois Rosodi was actually Rose Otis. Rosodi was making up her name of Rose Otis, and that she was a family member of Richard Otis, Otis captured at Concheco in 1689 and brought to Quebec by the Native Americans and sold as a servant. But how was she related to Richard Otis? Was she a daughter, a granddaughter? I continued my research. A lot is known about Richard Otis's family and who his children were. Richard first married Rose Stoughton and had sons Richard and Stephen. After his first wife's death, he married two more times. And his third wife was Grizel, the woman that was captured by the Native Americans in the 1689 attack on Concheco. Richard also had a daughter named Rose, who was not captured during the attack, or if she was, was one of the girls that was soon recovered. She's not our Rose Otis. Richard Jr. also had a daughter named Rose, but records indicate that she was not our Rose that married Jeanne Pointbent. Many records for the time period indicate that Stephen Otis, Richard Otis's son, had many children that were captured and taken to Quebec. Most genealogists, including myself, believe Francois Rosotti was Stephen Otis's daughter, captured and sold in Quebec at the age of 11 in 1689. None of Stephen's children ever returned to New Hampshire. Instead, they remained with the families that supported them in Quebec, and they converted to the Roman Catholic faith. This is what happened with Rose, who married in 1696 at the age of 18 to Jeanne Pointbem in Quebec. Further research unearthed a fellow genealogist's 1989 research, Sister Potvin, who was also a descendant of Francois Rosotti. In her research, she unearthed a marriage contract signed a few days before the marriage record I found in the Druin collection. I had not yet located this marriage contract, but she states in her records that the contract listed Francois as Rosotis, one word, and stated Francois Rosotis, daughter of deceased Stinotis and of deceased Mary Otis, her father and mother, of English birth in the environs of Boston. Stinotis is the phonetic French spelling of Stephen Otis, and her mother was Mary Pittman Otis. The mystery was solved. Francois Rosotti was Rose Otis, daughter of Stephen and Mary Otis, granddaughter of Richard and Rose Otis, of Conchico, New Hampshire. In 1689, at the age of 11, Rose witnessed the brutal attack on her family's home by Abenaki Native Americans. She probably saw the murder of her grandfather, her father, 
and her mother, along with the burning of her home. She would have been tied by the neck and hands with the other captives and marched hundreds of miles by foot, probably without shoes and in her night clothes, all the way to Quebec. Once there, she was sold as a slave to a French family and gained her freedom at the age of 18 when she married Eugène Pointvin. Obviously, the French family that bought her treated her as a member of the family because Rose never attempted to return to New Hampshire or her English family. Her brothers who were taken captive as well did not return to their English family either. Did Rose feel more at home and safe with her new French family over the years as opposed to the life she lived in the New Hampshire wilderness subject to Native American raids and a hard life on the frontier? I suspect so. Further research on Rose's family on her grandmother, Rose Stoughton's line, leads back to King Henry III of England. So we're not done with this particular line yet, but that's a story for another time. I hope you enjoyed this trip through early New England and French Canadian history. If you did, be sure to like our channel and click the bell to receive notifications when our next episode is released. This is Anna Sester with I Dig Dead People. Thanks for joining us.